Hey there, everybody. My name is Matt Levon. I am totally confused on something. This is our first webinar, so thank you all for bearing with me. I see there are some actual attendees, but I thought I would like see you all show up on a little screen that I have to the right of my screen, but I don't see any of you all there, so I thought nobody was here. But now I see there are seven attendees. So um, I am going to try to get things started here. Um, I see this little chat button. Would definitely love to see people join on the chat, but um, forgive my disorientation here. So as I said, my name is Matt Liban. I am with Custom Foodscaping and The Foodscaper. Today, we're gonna to be talking about commercial projects. And this is really like our first webinar ever. And we're really kind of winging it here a little bit, figuring out how to best support all of you foodscapers out there and um see see if we can get this dialogue going together. So we are going to talk a little bit about first the story of custom foodscaping and I will begin there and then I will actually launch into some of the various projects that we have worked on. So um we are in St. Louis, Missouri here with Custom Foodscaping. And that's what that picture is, the top left-hand corner. And my story kind of began here as a kid who was pretty, um, you know, just very suburban, not very much of a outdoor lover, didn't get a lot of exposure to the outdoors. And then I had the opportunity to do the Peace Corps in Paraguay after college, which is that next picture with the cattle. And um, and that was like a huge eye opener for me to kind of get exposed to the, to the great outdoors and to growing food. And, um, and I'm, I'm just gonna pause really quick here and ask if, if any, uh, Lindsay or Hannah, if you are able to, I don't know if there's the opportunity to enable people to have their video shared or if that's a thing that I'm not able to see, but maybe maybe I'm missing something, but generally I'm able to see everybody else's, everybody else who's in the room in my little video screen, but no worries if that's not possible. So let's see. So anyway, continuing with my story, while I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Paraguay, I um, got introduced to permaculture and it totally rocked my world. And I had a uh, a total like aha moment, like this is what I am meant to be learning about. This is so inspiring. It felt like the answer to so many of the different problems that I was disillusioned by. And then I came across Eric Tonsmeyer's work, and that's the picture in the top middle there. And Eric, if you haven't come across his work, he wrote Edible Forest Gardens with Dave Jackie, and then he wrote Paradise Lot. And this book, Paradise Lot, was kind of a, a monumental book for me. And it was all about creating backyard forest gardens and edible landscapes and perennial foodscapes. And it was just like, exactly what I wanted to be involved in. And I kind of steered, if that's a word, steered my whole trajectory uh, of life and learning towards that um, idea. And, and that really brought me to like working on some educational farms and learning about market gardening and learning, learning about fruit trees. And eventually after um, gaining some of that knowledge, started custom foodscaping that was five years ago. Um, most of our team is in the bottom right hand picture there as it stands now. And um, yeah, so it's been a growing enterprise and it has been incredibly uh, life giving. And I feel so blessed to, to, to call those folks my, my coworkers, also known as my bandmates, because we fancy ourselves a band. So 
we are going to talk about a few different projects here today and um and we're going to highlight three different projects and i'm really just hoping this can be like an opportunity for us to talk and i would love to answer as many people's questions as possible but um i am i'm hoping that we can besides the chat we can try to find a way here where i can see people's faces and actually just take you off mute and we can ask regular questions but if that doesn't happen i'm looking at the chat and would love to make that happen so these are the three projects we're going to talk about we are going to um i'm going to share a little bit about them and then would love to just like see what sparks your interest i know that with me like i love looking at all the other foodscapers projects and i feel like i have so many questions when i look at a picture and i'm like want people to have that opportunity here and hopefully i can share what we have learned and give my insights but by no means do i have all the answers here and hopefully we can all do, even just generally collaborate on on some of these things and um just share knowledge. That's really what this is all about. Okay, so this was like our first big project, our first commercial project. It was a restaurant space. What you're looking at there is the existing restaurant um, patio. And this is kind of like a fancy upscale farm to table restaurant. And I was working at this farm school before custom foodscaping and we were delivering food to them weekly. And so then I kind of just pitched them like, hey, I'm leaving Earth Dance, which is the name of the organic farm school. And I'm starting this thing, custom foodscaping. Would you want to turn this space into like an edible space? And they were like, absolutely. That's what we've always dreamed of. They had previously worked at Stone Barn Center for Food and Agriculture, which is like a farm and restaurant in outside New York City. So they were super like familiar with the idea of food for the restaurant growing right outside the restaurant. And that was a, that first moment where I kind of like pooped my pants a little bit and was like, oh my gosh, I actually have to like do this now and people are going to see it. And I would never done this before um, because really my experience prior to this was all like on farms in my backyard and friends' backyards and really not like super exposed and visible. And so it was incredibly exciting, but I had no idea how to make it happen. And we kind of like went back and forth on a lot of different concepts. And then eventually they were like, went radio silent. And I was like, oh no, they don't want to do a project with me. And and then I was so lucky that I came, a, I, I have a, a buddy who's like a landscape designer and artist. And we came up with this idea to just like give them this design basically and get them inspired. So I met him over at the site. I kind of gave him my vision for what um, the foodscape would look like. And then he drew it up like this. And then I sent it to them. And then they were like, bam, because this is, this is beautiful, right? Like I was, I was so lucky that he sketched this up and kind of reimagined what this space could look like. And that was really, um, that was really the, the start of them getting back to us and saying like, okay, like, let, let's make this happen. Right. And so then also my buddy who is this designer was able to uh, come up with like a, a plan that looked professional, which I did not have the skills to do. And he helped formulate this. And so we focused on some, like a lot of plants that we're going to, you know, that are kind of like the bread and butter for a lot of our, a lot of our plantings. I mean, it's just, well, I should say some of these are, and they're based on like plants that look good, that don't have a lot of pest and disease issues, um, and that can handle this tight space. So we focused on things like jujubes and strawberries and lots of herbs and figs and elderberries and that was um, ultimately how we got started. So used a subcontractor, had the restaurant, actually didn't even use a subcontractor, told the restaurant, hey, like you get a, 
please rip, <laughs> please rip everything out that's currently growing there, find new homes for it. I had none of the tools or equipment to, to do that. And, um, and so they did. And then I asked them to excavate, like, I believe six inches of the existing kind of like infill soil that was there and replace it with good, what we use as raised bed mix soil um, or garden mix soil. And a lot of times that soil is like 50% compost, 50% topsoil. So that's what we put in the beds. And then we topped that with leaf mulch, which is a beloved mulch uh, preference of mine. So I had met through my previous job, this guy, Dan, and uh, Dan had built a retaining wall at the farm I was working at. And he just, he had a dump truck and I was like, gosh, this seems like the kind of guy who knows how to do things, you know? So I asked Dan if he would help me do this project. And he was like such a sweetheart and mentored me along. Um, and so you can see, we kind of laid out these paths with sand that we were going to use as pathways and then we started to lay brick in he taught me how to lay a gravel pathway and and i learned what it was to excavate out really deep and backfill with with gravel and then put the sand on top and then a little little mallet and a a nice level to make sure that those paths were laid out properly and so then we kind of got those paths laid out and then it was like planting day. Um, and so we, we focused a lot. You can see on the edge here, like there was this nice retaining wall in front. We used sweet potatoes and nasturtiums, first nasturtiums, then swapped them out in July for sweet potatoes along the edge. And then we use a lot of strawberries as a main feature. We use tons of edible flowers. Um, and we, um, yeah, it, you can kind of see what, what we kind of got into. Then this is the end of the first year. Things were filling in a little bit. You can see like there's, there's very little, you know, our trees were still like little babes and the shrubs even like super small. So it was exciting to use things like calendula and Johnny jump ups and different edible flowers just to like get people engaged right away and that that year I remember like that planting along the retaining wall which is alpine strawberries that is um that was incredibly productive that first year and they harvested like a million alpine strawberries and when I say they harvested the all this harvest was being done by the kitchen staff themselves and yeah, this is kind of like over on the left hand side of the screen. It was um, there's a back door you can see there, and that's much closer to like the back door where the kitchen staff is. And um, so this whole area on the left side, that left picture was all these different perennial herbs, you know, thyme and perennial onions and uh, oregano and bronze fennel and things of that nature that chefs could kind of just like pop out without being so visible to the clients and customers who were dining and just grab whatever they need. And then we, you know, that trellis that's back there at the end, we set those posts in and every year something fun like climbing beans and Malabar spinach grow up there. So this is a really unique foodscape for us in that there's a lot of annuals and it's kind of like, edible landscaping with annuals that is is kind of a unique thing for us um, we don't typically grow things like beans and plant edible flowers in the spring for people but this is a very um you know heavy maintenance needed a lot of maintenance this this project and luckily the the staff had a really solid gardener who could help make sure that all this was thriving because we certainly weren't out there every week. In fact, we had no maintenance um, initially. And then eventually like things started to grow in and we had, you know, uh, just a few years later, you know, figs were, this is kind of like what figs look like in our climate in that middle picture. Um, they don't get super big. And we intentionally wanted them to look quite small so that they wouldn't overtake the jujube trees 
that were kind of the main features of the landscape. And we use jujube trees here because they are quite pest and disease resistant. And this is such a visible space that we didn't want to create a, um, you know, any kind of like spotted leaves and things that would look a little bit, uh, you know, pest and disease riddled. So jujubes were a good choice for us. And they've been incredibly productive the last few years. They're massive right now and they're way taller than the building and we have to prune them and they've grown really fast and um, they've been really great. And then we grow a lot of other things that they like. You can see in the picture on the right that there's uh, a lot of gum frina. Is that purple? And that was a flower that we use a lot. It's a dried flower, a flower that can be dried and used throughout the winter. So we love that one. And then there's just, you know, marigolds to add that cottage garden vibe and feel throughout the landscape. So this has been um, a really, really rewarding life-giving project for us. And it was, a, it was, because it was our first project, it was like, yeah, just lots of learning. Definitely, um, I'm trying to think about the lessons already. Like these were some of the mistakes I made. The, the first mistake I was about to mention is that we didn't charge. Well, I shouldn't, this is an interesting one. We, we charge way less than it cost. And, you know, I, you could say we charge way too little, but I would, I'm kind of, I was able to charge a little because I was, um, you know, had set my life up in a way that I didn't, I needed legitimacy way more than I needed money at this moment. So I felt like, even though looking back, I, I, I could have, we, we could have charged double is probably what it was worth, but, but we didn't, we just, um, I wanted to, you know, this project ended up being kind of like a feature for just getting the business started. So that was one of the mistakes. Another one of the mistakes you'll notice is that like, I use a lot of plugs and I'm used to in gardening, like using trays of like 72 or 50 and having and growing out plants and like little plugs that you'd plant in a more market garden setting. Turns out that, that, that has just been a thing that, you know, it doesn't make that big of a difference. If you're growing a hundred, 200 plants, um, getting actual like quartz would have weighed, would have make made way more sense. The plants would have been much further along and I uh, I wish I had just like continued even for those edible flowers like things like gumfrina and marigolds you know sure by the end of the summer like everything fills in and looks great but for a place like this it's totally worth like an extra few hundred bucks to have things be a month ahead so that things are looking great by June first as opposed to July first in our climate at least um, because we can't really plant these things till till the end of April for most of them. I, um, you'll see in the picture on the left, like things are even, in my opinion, a bit too close together. Like I definitely learned that it's uh, so hard not to plant all the things you just like love, but definitely thinking about proper spacing. Um, and also just, you know, just learned like some, some plants get bigger than the, uh, previous experience that I had had with them. And when you plant things in a, in a place like this, where there was drip irrigation and really good loose soil that we had brought in, you know, I learned that, wow, things are, can grow really fast and really big and was trying to kind of do this like food forest concept that had, you know, had been a big inspiration of mine of like packing shrubs close to trees. And, and I've really like, regretted that and and we've pulled a few plants out but I really think like highlighting trees and giving them proper space to like look beautiful and work their strut their stuff with all their space um, around them is a really is a preferred aesthetic for me as opposed to having kind of like understory shrubs you know currents that grow right up next to trees not super uh not not super aesthetic and it's very high 
visibility location in my opinion and then yeah like they said they were on maintenance but they just they have really in my opinion needed way more maintenance and and they never in until this last year they never signed up for maintenance from us and it has just been a really i i wish that i had said like we're we can move forward with this but i we need we need to make sure that i'm out here every month because there's just so there's so much nuance with a landscape like this and so many things that um, I felt were, you know, getting managed, um, improperly or not getting managed at all, or weeds weren't getting pulled. And then it was kind of a poor reflection on our business because a lot of people ended up associating, knowing that this was a job that we had worked on because we were fortunate enough to get some press, um, about this landscape because, this restaurant was making waves and getting a lot of really good press. So those are some of the mistakes there. Um, so I'm going to pause here for a second and read the chat because this is a, this is the time where I would love to hear questions about this project. So seeing Lindsay saying that we'll not be sharing this video during the webinar. So please post your questions at the end in the chat. Katie, I'm seeing your question right here. I don't know, you know, if folks have questions about this Visia project, um, you can definitely feel free to post your questions now. And then that way we can talk about this project before we move on to the next one. Yeah, so great question, Katie, about how often to recommend maintenance. Um, I would say once a month. And I mean, obviously that is very much a case by case because it, it really depends on like some of the things that you're planting um, and what is their capacity to fill in the gaps. But if they didn't have anybody knowledgeable on staff that was able to help, you know, manage it at all, I would say like even two weeks, you know, especially if it's, in a location where you can stop by rather frequently. There's just, sometimes when we get there after a month, it can be like, whoa, a bomb went off. So we are doing monthly maintenance right now and it's enough. Like it doesn't feel like things are ever out of control, but maybe every three weeks even, you know, could be a happy medium. So I generally, I feel like I hate just doing like piddly visits where there's very little to do and the client is kind of paying for just like a stop by because if you go every two weeks, then they're not, there's not a lot going on. And I hate all the, like the organizational time and the transportation time has to get recouped. And of course that, that has to be, that cost has to be passed on to the client. So I feel like we can be way more efficient and so it's almost like I'm looking out for the client more than I'm looking out for our business. But it's also really hard to find staff who feel confident doing this. So it's a really big drain on me because training people to work with such a diverse palette of plants, everything from figs to edible flowers to, you know, what to do with these jujubes. It's if you haven't worked with these plants, it's a lot. Um, and so it's a giving up a lot of my own time if we were to do every every two weeks or something like that. Okay, so then Andrea asks, uh, let's see. How did the staff handle pest control? So in, in this uh, landscape, there are no real pests. Um, so like the main features of this landscape are things like the jujube trees, the figs, there's elderberry, there's bush mulberry, there's... Um, a bush cherry, and then there's lots of herbs and flowers. And so there's just, yeah, plant selection is just like really key. Uh, there are no pests in this landscape. I mean, of course there's like, there have been no pest issues. That's not to say there's not a little pest here and there, but um, you know, yeah, like this, this is so heavily planted with herbs and edible flowers and things that just don't have pests, like, 
yeah, all those things, the nasturtiums and the, I'm looking at this picture, there's like lemongrass and then sweet potatoes, like sweet potatoes don't really have issues in our climate. So just knowing your plants and selecting off of that, hopefully, I, I, I realize that can sound ridiculous because gardens have pests and diseases, but in this case, you know, just selecting correctly is just key. Um, Dana asked, did you have the restaurant deal with permitting? There was no permitting needed for this. There was nothing that, you know, this was already established as a landscaped area. And so that was, they just changed out the plants that were there. Um, so nothing, no structures were built, no retaining walls were built that I had to deal with. And yeah, Katie, we also try, like, I think monthly is kind of the sweet spot for me for residential clients. Uh, I think it, some of our like more like vegetable clients are more every two weeks, but I don't even like going that often. I just, mostly because we don't have the right person and that's a lot of money. So we also don't have like the kinds of clients that are going to pay us to come every two weeks. But maybe, you know, if we pushed it harder or maybe if we tried to angle ourselves more into like a super high end clientele, like super wealthy, but it's a lot of our clients, I mean, like obviously they have disposable income if they're paying us at all, but they generally are not doing like, yeah, we just don't have a lot of our clients that are, would want us to come twice a week or twice a month. Okay. So that's Visia. Does it, any last questions before I move on from Visia? Let's see if I can. I got light my light button on there. Cool. All right, we can always hop back. So I'm gonna move on. All right. So oh, I had planned to show you all this video, which is a short video about this next project. I'm gonna hit play here. Will you all let me know in the comments and just let me know that the actual video is working and that you can hear it. And then if not, I'll stop and just move on. Hmm. That we kind of talk about a lot is we want to be more than here. just such a miraculous experience to watch somebody walk in here and then they just a smile comes to their face you see the, the weight of the world dropping off of their shoulders it's it's a it is a magical space big thing with the why that we kind of talk about a lot is we want to be more than a gym and swim so uh, it's a place for all um and this opportunity i hear truly you know sets us apart from a lot of things it brings the community together uh, it makes our community stronger. There's just so many more things out here than just growing vegetables and, and that. So there's a lot of educational that goes into it. Uh, and the main thing is, is that therapy, that, that therapeutic part that has uh, was just for everyone. We learned during COVID that this is a very special community. This is a place that we can gather safely. But like, what else can we do to give back to the community? Um, one of the ideas was mental health. And as we came out of the pandemic, you know, mental health was a huge thing. So um, just looking at a different area uh, that can kind of help that. Kind of had a, a vision, but we didn't know how to put that, you know, vision to reality. So that's where we reached out to custom foodscaping and really kind of helped bring our vision to life. Uh, and it's just a fantastic place and so much more that we can still do that we want. I'm out here constantly. It's kind of my place to come out and, and unwind. If I'm having a bad day, I'll just come out here for a little bit and 
walk around, uh, touch something, smell something, pull something off you know, one of the plants and, and eat it. So uh, it's great for the mind, uh, good stress reliever. So if you're considering it, don't hesitate it, take a look at it, it it's well worth it. The kids immediately, when we do workshops, they're always over here grabbing cement, putting it in their water. It's just so awesome how they are, are understanding what you can do with plants at such an early age. Okay, dope. So that was um, a little bit about that project. So this was grant funded, uh, just so people know. I plugged my headphones back in. Are you, are you all able to hear me now talking about this? Okay, cool. Um, thanks, thanks for all your responses. So this is, let's see. All right. So you can see this was the initial design and I'm just like feeling a lot of, uh, not anxiety, but so I don't have any professional design skills. And um, I learned like some super basic design concepts from the uh, a class I took many years ago that was at the Foodscaper Summit this last year called using like Google, this is in Google Slides. And um, there's a lot of, what was it? The, or PowerPoint, right? But basically, the important thing that is super important that, that things are to scale, and that um, when I went out to the site visit, you know, I took good measurements. That's key. And so, basically, like this is the reason I'm sharing this with you all is to see just this was a twenty thousand dollar job for us, which was a big job, and um. I'm seeing that a bunch of things kind of got moved around. So things look weirdly spaced. Then they just got moved around last time this presentation got opened. <laughs> but um, you get the idea. And there's, uh, so it was this design with a lot of other slides that I'm going to go through quickly to show you because where, where, you know, my lack of design skills allowed, required that I use other images to help convey what this what this was going to be all about for them. So, you know, all these different ideas of the, we did these groupings of hexagon garden beds. And with each hex bed, we were going to kind of make a different theme and use different signage, you know, so just, I won't, won't go through all of them in depth, but I loved this like citrus themed group, you know, so in one of them, we did a hearty orange bush surrounded by the um, lemon balm, lime thyme, sorrel, which is really lemony, and then some annuals like lemon verbena and lemon eucalyptus. So just like a whole place where you could go get your citrus vibe on. Um, use that, you know, this image to indicate like what the beds were going to look like and just make sure that we were communicating really clearly like what, what are you getting with this? Um, and just different themes everywhere. So one of the themes of the big beds was this edible spring shoots and sh different shoot vegetables. Um, we wanted to, you know, we were invoking the senses everywhere possible. So everywhere where there was an opportunity to do something funky, we did it to create conversation by using only purple asparagus, no green asparagus. Um, they didn't end up having budget for the rock garden. So we did this edible candy grouping um, we did a grouping where we attracted caterpillars. Um, this has become a thing since this job that the uh, we've done like probably four or five times now, which is this idea of a bus stop, even though it's, we actually have built now one literal bus stop, but it's the basic idea of a bench with a pergola above it and grapes growing on it. And uh, you'll see what that actually looked like. So this was kind of like the image that we used this feature they ended up changing they didn't end up um having budget for that so it didn't didn't happen but just different focused areas like a smell grouping and a touch grouping and each one of these was a was based off of on uh these different ideas and this is being done with google slides it was a really tight space as you saw from the videos. So like fruit trees weren't really an opportunity, weren't a very easy thing to do. So 
sold them on the idea of the espaliered apples. We used a bunch of natives to do a listening area. They had this existing area. You can see it. If you look at the top left hand corner, or just kind of in the top middle, they had this kind of like existing concrete structure with rails. And so we built, we, we didn't want to like demo that because it was an opportunity to do something interesting. So we built a garden bed up next to it. And then we used cattle panel to make it into a fort where like, it's hard to see, but on the other side, there's like an entrance where a kid can kind of go in and there, we wanted this to be really kid friendly, you know, so the kids can go in and like hide in the passion fruit fort. We wanted to do all different colors of raspberries and just evoking that, that sensory garden feel of just wonder and exploration and whoa, there's all these different raspberries. Um, we had a whole walkable mint bed where we put stepping stones into mint garden bed. And that mint garden bed was only like a, made out of two by fours. So it was only, you know, four inches tall and you walk right through it. And then when you walk on the mint, obviously many of you all probably know how amazing it is to walk through mint. You just get a huge dose of, of delight. So that was all part of the, um, the sensory garden, you know, here's a great example of using our, using photos and using an existing garden bed that we built then on the top left to try to make up for some of the fact that the design doesn't exactly capture this or, you know, these photos obviously tell a thousand words in terms of what the client could anticipate getting. So now we're actually getting to the install. Um, and so we're, we pre-built all these beds and generally, um, yeah, that's how we like to roll is we come in with all the beds built and then we can kind of turn and burn and get everything laid out and then just start um, leveling all of our beds. And um, you can see in the bottom, if you look in the picture on the right, you'll see there's three hexagon beds. And so we chose different um, height lumber to use for each of these beds. So there's one bed is made out of like two by six, another bed out of two by eight, and another out of two by 10. So that way we were able to kind of like have varied height with all those, what we call hexagon trios. And the original hexagon trio photo that I showed you several slides back, that was from Nashville Foodscapes, by the way. And they, they really introduced me to the concept of the hexagon trio. So you can see, this is just kind of like fun operation stuff for us. This is how we show up. You can see that wheel, those wheelbarrows that are full of stuff on the left-hand photo. We, we've gotten into this habit of when we get in the shop, we load all the wheelbarrows as full as possible. And then we team lift two people at a time a full wheelbarrow into the bed of the truck or into the trailer. And then we just strap those down. That way we can team unload the wheelbarrows and then just push them where they're fr um, full, wherever they need to go. And then we don't need to throw all the stuff in and pull everything out. It's already in the wheelbarrows and we never have to even take it out of the wheelbarrows. Um, so that's been kind of like a fun thing that we, we felt <laughs> I've been excited about at least. And then you can see Emily in the right hand picture, she is watering. So when we do a big planting, like the first thing we like to do is we pull all the plants out and somebody waters everything really, really thoroughly. And that way we don't need to worry about it because as soon as, as soon as the beds get filled, um, if I'm leading the gig in this case, like I'm going to want to start placing those plants all over the landscape so that they're available and then people know when a plant is placed it is ready to plant and i can't do that unless everything is really well watered so we like to just water first at the beginning of the day when we unload and make sure everything's super wet um so then we uh use old bob kitty we, this is our uh you know we haven't initially we haven't formally inducted Bob Kitty into the band, but I would see this as a really important part of our band. We do not own Bob Kitty here, but Bob Kitty is, is that little track machine with the bucket that you're looking at. Um, so it's, it's, it's amazingly powerful. I mean, this was a tool as a 
as a gardener that, you know, I didn't have a lot of knowledge about like this, using big tools like this and renting them for the day and what it takes to rent them and just the ability to pull them like totally new world for me getting started in all this. Um, basically needed like a three quarter ton truck to be able to pull something this big. We now have some trailers that this can go on, but at the, at our first uses, you can rent a trailer for the day too to pull one of these things. And so then they'll just hook it up for you on your, on your hitch. If you have a truck that'll pull it. And, um, this is, uh, yeah, we had to move like 15 yards of soil and, and, you know, grade a lot of the site to make sure we could set these beds level. So Bob Kitty, incredibly powerful. I think we pay like $180 a day to rent this, or you can do kind of a week and get a discounted price. So then, you know, planted things, things are kind of like starting to grow up and in, you can kind of see the progression. I found three photos of, of, uh, the same bed. You can see the bed on the left. That's a raspberry bed. And you can see what it looked like shortly after we planted it. Like then in the middle, you know, later that season. And then the next photo on the right, which is kind of is like the a whole two, like two or three years later, um, probably I think two years later. So the entire bed is full and exploding with raspberry plants. And, um, and this was like a, um, I forgot to mention like the soil here is like pure rock. You would never guess it by looking at necessarily that photo on the right. But there was almost, there's very, very little decent soil. Like you can't even really get a shovel into this site. You can't even dig down. It's so rocky. It's just gravel fill. So that's why, by the way, that we use these raised beds is because we needed to bring in a lot of soil and we knew this was going to be a highly visible, highly trafficked public space. So we wanted it to be super, um, super, like just clean lines, easy to traverse. Here's the espaliate apple and the bus stop there. You can see the grape in the middle of the bus stop growing up. And then those, those vines need to be trellised off to the sides so they can grow up the sides. Here you can see a view of the actual uh, bus stops and some of the other views there. You can see those hexagon trios all filled in looking really interesting and, and doing their thing. Um, let's see. Yeah, some more pictures of, the, of what, what these looked like after a year or two. So one of the things that some of the mistakes, we discovered that there was landscape, like weed fabric under several inches of like soil and mulch. So that was a thing that I learned a lesson on, like dig around a lot to find out if you're going to just come across a ton of weed barrier that you have to dig out. And then it's awkward to talk to the client like, hey, there was this weed fabric, like this is going to take us a lot longer to grade this site and to set these beds level because every time we dig, we're hitting weed fabric. So that's where Bob Kitty is also really helpful because you can just tear things up quickly. Um, we didn't think super thoroughly about how to get posts deeply in the ground here. So that was a, um, you know, when you have really rough sites, like how do you get, how do you set trellis posts? And we did some workarounds and ultimately we couldn't tension our wires super tight because we weren't able to set the posts very deep in the ground because of the intense rock and um, probably could have, you know, gone eventually like we could have jackhammered through and gotten the post deeply in the ground but that just we were there this was like 45 minutes from our shop and there were just certain things we we had to do like just do the best we can kind of thing um they didn't have money for us to run irrigation to this entire site but i wish that we had just convinced them to stub in irrigation into each of these beds ahead of time so that we could efficiently run irrigation later because a year or two after we installed this they did have us come back and install drip irrigation and and we had to do it a way that wasn't as clean 
and tidy as if we had just thought about it in the beginning and, and stubbed irrigation lines in, even though they wouldn't be connected to anything. That way we could get the irrigation lines on the insides of the beds. Um, and then we also like, we were right on the heels of another contractor here. So it was kind of a mess to keep with our schedule. So just learned a lesson, like really, really telling clients, like we're trying not to work right after another contractor is in the space and give yourself months, like, um, or, you know, have a backup job ready to go if you have to push your job and, so you don't have to scramble at the last minute because we had to do some scrambling here and I wish we'd, uh, you know, it makes for a stressful situation. Nobody knows where they're going to be. And so, um, yeah, I think that what, that's it with the YMCA. What, what questions y'all have with the Y? This is treated pine, Jessica. Um, that's the lumber here. We typically use eastern red cedar for our garden beds here because we can get it locally but this treated pine this is a few years ago and um the price was this was a lot of lumber this was significantly cheaper than the cedar and they did their budget only allowed for so much so they went with the pine <laughs> uh, we do not do maintenance of this job. This is a unique situation where there's like, I don't know if y'all saw in the video, but there's a huge community garden and they have a garden coordinator who like a program manager who the Y has on staff who helps with maintenance here. So we don't do maintenance. I wish we did. It would be, they could use it, but um, yeah, you know, it's, um, it's just a thing like they have a lot of gardeners, a lot of people all around. And so people, they don't really like feel the need to splurge on it. And it's a, it's a challenging thing because they will email with questions and at, you know, text with different questions about what's going on. And, you know, there's some confusing aspects. There's a lot of new plants in here for even people who do know quite a bit about plants. So they, um, but they've also really helped us spread the word to a lot of people. You know, this is a big YMCA. So it's been a great gig um, in terms of exposure. We, <laughs> Melissa asked if we charge commercial clients differently than residential. That's a great question. Um, yeah, I, yes. I would say we do charge differently for commercial. There's more, a lot of times there's more stakeholders with commercial. So we, um, it's a lot more communication. It's a lot more like site visits, come and talk to these people. So I, I would say we give a lot more padding and cushioning in our budgets for commercial clients than residential, you know, um, and, and I, we, I, we continue to do that. And I highly recommend that. Um, we do give clients copies of planting plans, Katie, but generally what we do is, what, what I like to do is I make a video of everything that's been planted and then I send it to the client at the end of the planting that way. And I'll just literally point and say, this plant here, this is, you know, Monarda fistulosa, this is bee balm, that, and and that way they have video record of it. We also use plant tags. If we plant a lot of a certain plant, we don't label every single plant. We just label the one that is in a group of, of several and we could do way better with plant labeling. Um, a lot of times like we'll determine the needs of plant labels based on like the interest of the client, how much they already know. Sometimes we plant and we plant things and like clients already know their stuff. Like they know everything that we planted. They don't need a plant tag. So we don't need to worry about it. Other times they're super gung ho we, and we give them a bunch of plant tags. Other times we know like they don't care. They're just like want it to look good. And so we kind of like cater how much time and energy we put into plant signs um, 
based on, on some of the client needs. So I'm gonna move on to our last one, which is on Olive. So this is a unique situation where it's a, it's right in like downtown St. Louis and it's a kind of intentional community like where it's like suburban like, but in the city. And it's like all these shared spaces, like a shared little park and a shared edible forest garden, which is what I'm gonna be showing you here. It's a share it. And then there's a pool and like a rec center area, but, but it's only like 20 houses right in the middle of the city of St. Louis. So um, that is kind of what we're, yeah, what we're looking at here. And this was like in combination with a architecture firm. And when I was presenting, like they, they knew they wanted an edible space in their community. And I presented all these different images and then they loved this image. And then I had to explain to them, okay, well, that's a vegetable garden. Like what you want, what they had told me they want is like, you know, a, a food forest or a forest garden, which is like all perennial. So we worked with the architects and they ended up creating something like this, which is kind of this patchwork vibe of a market garden with cool meandering paths that go through it all but still trying to, to grow things like in a block, like a, like a checkerboard or like a quilt. And so, I don't know, I, I, I had never thought about design in, in the way they had like thinking about lines and drawing inspiration. And I just thought this was really neat and um, a different way of thinking about like designing an edible forest garden or a food forest. So this is kind of how we mapped it out. And you can see like, there's, there's a lot of different um you can see a lot of our main plant selections um natives like aronia and elderberry and clove currants and lots of pie cherry i love pie cherry because in our climate generally pie cherries don't have a lot of pest and disease issues nor do things like asian pears and service berries so everywhere you don't see a tree symbol is filled in with the plants that you see on the left things like funky herbs like lovage and lemon thyme and sea kale and asparagus and um, lavender, all things to engage these people who live here in, in the landscape. So this is kind of what it looked like um, as we got started. The initial contractor of the whole site like laid out those pathway lines, so we didn't do that. And then we came in, we brought in all this good soil, similar to that very first job, actually. And then we like tilled it up to make sure that we could plant really quickly. And then we just laid everything out. Um, you can see in the right hand picture, there's a red line next to Wyatt planting that little pie cherry tree. And so we, we marked out and we ran strings from one end of the site to the other to make sure we could maintain the rows you can see in the left hand picture there's stakes running all along and those are spaced every five feet um we moved those stakes that are that are hammered into the 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 straw so that we could um run strings and then paint lines and then we knew later how to make those to make sure that we were abiding by the different rows you'll see what that means in a second here so plants get laid out, we plant, <clears throat> and then you can see we, um, so we use two different color mulches to help differentiate the rows and create a lot of visual interest there. So we use leaf mulch and then a darker, like um, what we just call organic mulch at the, <laughs> at the supply yard here in St. Louis. excuse me um dirty fun time so lots of things here uh, aronia berries and things on the right here we we see lemon balm and that's a, a young hybrid persimmon um oh, in the right those yellow flowers are cut leaf cone flower or rutabecchia lacinata which is a really nice delicious um edible green 
things like strawberries um, in certain areas, which need to be maintained, but are such a great ground cover. Very little pest and disease issues with strawberries. We use a lot of Roman chamomile, which has, just spreads in beautifully as a perennial chamomile and is just a gorgeous tea plant. And this has been, um, we're just two years into this site. There was tons of compaction. We went, we asked the client to like aerate the space thoroughly by using machines to like dig their tines in and fork it up because they'd driven on it so much, but they did a terrible job with that. And we've had huge issues ever since then. I wish we'd kind of kept them to their word more and made them aerate the space better. We ended up using too much mulch on this site and it was problematic. Like we ended up bringing a ton of mulch and we didn't have a lot of other places to take it. And so we just put it, instead of putting it like two and a half inches, like I would, I generally like two and a half inches of mulch. We probably ended up more like four inches just because we had the mulch and we wanted to get it off the truck. That was a mistake. I think we should have just dealt with the extra mulch, brought it somewhere, done something because we, I felt like we really paid for the consequences of that and that things didn't infiltrate well and I vigor seemed low. And I, I really think plants were not happy with that amount of mulch around them. Um, they ended up bringing in sprinklers and using overhead, even though we had kind of specified in our agreement that we needed drip irrigation. And so then all those fruit trees are just in bushes are just getting sprayed with a overhead irrigation. That's just kind of been a little bit of a nightmare trying to get them to convert over to drip, but it's been a little bit out of our control. Finally, I would say that once people started moving into this community, they had lots of questions about the foodscape and there was not the needed signage. So they would like scurry over to us every time we come for maintenance we go do monthly maintenance here and ask all these questions like where can i plant tomatoes and what is this plant and how do i use it so with with high visibility jobs like this like it's incumbent upon the signage has to be part of the deal and it doesn't you know it, yeah so i wish we had pressed that a bit harder and um even just general signage like of what a perennial foodscape is because people were really disappointed. They, they thought there would be like tomatoes and peppers and that's not what the vision was. Initially, it was a, it's a perennial foodscape. So um, people were kind of bummed about that. So signage would have helped deal with that. And that's what I got for y'all. So um, yeah, Katie, I love all your questions. Okay, Katie. Katie asked, do we do walkthroughs of the space with clients after? Yeah, we always do walkthroughs with clients after an install. Like that's that's key. I, I don't leave a site if I haven't done a walkthrough with a client. I want to make sure that a client is super happy with the project and that they know everything that they're looking at. And that goes in hand in hand with the video that we make for them. <clears throat> um, in this case, we did do... Um, a workshop and a class this year and we're doing another one next year to engage people in the space and so that that's highly recommended you know that our our last class that we did in this space was like a, a smash hit you know people loved it all the neighbors were coming out and talking to each other and and i made everybody eat everything and try all kinds of funky herbs and uh so yeah, it was a, it was a great time and, uh, and worked out really well, but yeah, the ultimately, you know, all, not all questions get asked during those things and it took a while to get organized. And so ultimately people were, there was a long lead up until that first, uh, until that first class. <clears throat> so connecting with these clients, you know, I, I don't know exactly how they found us. I forget, but we do not market to them. What we do is Lindsay will talk more about this in our upcoming webinar about marketing, but basically people like this found out about us because we got press. So getting press has been huge for attracting clients like this. Uh, you know, when I say press, I'm mostly talking about like 
food magazine, like magazines and newspapers in town and making sure that, you know, I think Lindsay on our team, like wrote them like some press releases and, and just sent pitches out and said like, this is what we're doing. You want to run a story on it kind of thing. And she could talk more intelligently about that. But, but once these articles go out, you know, people, I think people kind of like, like a developer, for example, the developer might just like put that idea in their pocket, you know, and think about how to, um, how, oh, maybe we could use this company when we develop a site next year and in a few years, like this project's coming together. So that's been a really helpful way of getting the word out as well as doing courses, doing classes locally, like speaking as everywhere I can you know, to garden club groups and at the library and at local nursery garden centers and just speaking and getting out in front of people. Um, Cause people tell their friends, you know, people share that, that has been very helpful in just trying to increase reach and make sure that people in the St. Louis community know about us when they are thinking about doing something foodscape related, garden related, whatnot. So yeah. So that, yeah, we, you can see Lindsay sent a, a link in the notes of the article that was covered about this, but then how did they even find out about us, you know, through similar articles and press? I, that's all I have for you all today. Um, I'm going to write in the chat my email, which is mad at custom food escaping.com. If you all have follow-up email, follow-up questions, please feel free to email me. And um, thank you all so much for joining our very first ever webinar for the Foodscaper. Uh, I hope it is just the first of many more to come. And I, um, we, you know, if, if you all don't know already, like, please head over to the foodscaper.com. Let us know what's going to be helpful for you all to support your all's education and growth as foodscapers. That is our whole mission and goal. So wishing everybody a delightful afternoon, evening, and hope to connect with you all more, more in person next time, more at least in video in person. So I can, um, you know, at least see your faces and, and hear your questions verbally. All right, y'all. Ciao.